Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new lecture of our course on heterogeneous systems. Today, we are going to talk about a fancy feature of the GPU programming frameworks that is called dynamic parallelism. These GPU programming frameworks, like CUDA and OpenCL, provide an interface to express dynamic refinement algorithms in a more natural way. This dynamic parallelism interface allows GPU threads to launch GPU kernels when new work is dynamically discovered. You may remember the example of uh, BFS, the graph search uh, pattern that we covered a few lectures ago. In BFS, remember that each node in the frontier has a different number of neighbors. So based on that, we have different amount of work depending on the neighbors, depending on the nodes that we have in the frontier. In these cases, dynamic parallelism can be extremely useful. Today, we are going to focus on CUDA dynamic parallelism. We are going to talk about important semantics when a kernel is launched from a kernel, and we are going to talk about performance considerations. Dynamic parallelism in CUDA, as I said before, allows us to perform device-side kernel launches. That is, allows GPU threads to launch new GPU kernels. This feature appeared with the Kepler architecture a few years back, and it's pretty useful for some typical cases like uh, dynamic load balancing, where kernels where we have uh, inner end load imbalance and we can find a better way of distributing the workload among the available threads, the, uh, data dependent execution, recursion, and also uh, library calls from kernels. Uh, these uh, dynamic parallelism feature allows us to write codes in a more easier way and, and, and in a way that is also more maintainable. Here in the at the bottom of the slide, you can just see the key difference between the pre um, uh, framework, uh, the CUDA framework, where all kernels on the GPU side had to be launched from the CPU. And uh, on the right-hand side, you can see what is possible since the Kepler architecture, not only uh, launching kernels from the CPU side, but also launching kernel kernels from within the kernel itself. As a motivation example, let me talk to you about turbulence simulation. Here in this slide, we can see a comparison of a fixed grid versus a dynamic grid for the turbulence simulation model. Imagine that, in, that there are some parts of the turbulence where we may want to go uh, much deeper into the details. We want to do more refinement, more fine grain analysis in this part here. And if we have a static grid, uh, we assign the work to threads in a static manner. We really need to um, have a very fine grain grid in, in all uh, the, the in, in all the existing uh, turbulence simulation, even though there might be some parts of the simulation where we are not really so much interested. However, if it's possible to create a dynamic grid and refine the computation and refine the grid as uh, we go uh, deeper into the analysis of the part of the turbulence simulation that is more interesting to us, we can save uh, computation and we can save execution time in those parts of the simulation that are not really so relevant while focusing much more and performing a much more fine-grained analysis in the really relevant part. So this is just one motivation on the slide. And here you see like the key differences between launching kernels without dynamic parallelism or with dynamic parallelism. Without dynamic parallelism, every time that we need to launch a new kernel and we want to deploy more threads and new thread blocks to perform computation, we have to return the control to the CPU. The CPU will have to figure out what's the number of threads and the number of thread blocks that we need in the next execution of the kernel and then launch the uh, kernel correspondingly. So as you see here, without dynamic parallelism, control returns very every time that a kernel finishes or every time that a bunch of uh, thread blocks finish the computation, control returns to the CPU for the CPU to launch a new kernel. However, if dynamic parallelism is available, the GPU and the GPU threads have the ability to launch new kernels and new thread blocks in these kernels 
as the world, new work is being discovered. And uh, this uh, frees the CPU for much longer time, and we don't have to return the control to the CPU with the corresponding overhead of launching new kernels from the CPU and also moving data from the GPU memory to the CPU memory for the CPU memory to figure out what's the number of thread blocks that need to be launched in the uh, next uh, GPU kernel. Here you can see very similar um, slide for the kernel launch without dynamic parallelism, but with a nice animation in this case, uh, we have a main thread in the, in the host CPU that launches uh, one kernel on the device. Uh, as soon as this kernel finishes, terminate, the re controllers returns to the host CPU that needs to figure out what's the number of threads, number of thread blocks that is needed in the next execution of the kernel and then launch launches the kernel um, um, as, as needed. So all this process is possible, uh, but it's more painful to program than if we have dynamic parallelism, where the kernel threads or the GPU threads can launch new kernels on the device without host communication. Here uh, you see the uh, on the right hand side, you can see the legend of this figure, these uh, larger um, this larger rectangle here represents the kernel. Inside the kernel, as you know, or inside the grid, as you know, we have uh, multiple thread blocks. Inside each of the thread block, we have several warps that are here represented by a dash line. And then inside the warp, we usually have 32 uh, threads, even though in this toy representation, we are only representing two of these uh, vertical bars that represent the threads. And in the slide, as you can see as well, these individual threads are able to launch new kernels that are um, uh, here at the bottom of the of the figure. So, for example, this thread zero in thread block zero is launching one kernel with only one thread block. This thread one in thread block zero in the in um, in the original uh, kernel launches a new kernel in this case with two thread blocks, as you can see. And here you can see another um, animation with the host originally in, in the beginning, the CPU thread running on the host CPU, CPU launches one kernel uh, on the device, on the GPU. And as soon as these threads start discovering new work, they are able to launch new kernels. All these um, rectangles here representing these kernels launched by the original GPU threads and, um, and, and, and inside these new kernels, we can find even more work and then launch more uh, uh, new kernels and so on and so forth until all computation is being done. And finally, the control returns to the um, uh, host CPU. So in this case, it's easier to write programs with uh, dynamically discovered parallelism. And it's also much easier to adapt the available resources to, them, to the amount of work that is um, dynamically discovered. Uh, um, the, the GPU dynamic parallelism allows us to program as well current and nested dependencies. Here you can see a very simple example where we have a main function executed on the CPU that um, launches three kernels, A, B, C, one after the other. Um, but if you look at the, the internals of the or the code for kernel uh, B, we see that this kernel B is also launching uh, three more uh, kernels, X, Y, and Z. So um, this is the type of nested dependencies that uh, the dynamic parallelism allows us to program. Uh, one uh, thing that I would like to highlight here is like the typical terminology that we are going to use for kernels in the context of dynamic parallelism. In this case, the kernel that has or contains or executes uh, or contains threads that launch new kernels is called the parent kernel. And we would call these threads launching new kernels the parent threads, uh, while the uh, new, uh, newly launched kernels, X, Y, and Z in this example, are called child kernels and the threads running in these child kernels, we can call them child threads. Here you see an example of uh, this type of nested dependencies, in particular is for the LU decomposition, that is a, a, a very useful technique for solving 
uh, systems or li of linear equations, if you look at how linear decompos uh, LU decomposition uh, needs to be done or needed to be done before um, the, the uh, appearance of uh, CUDA dynamic parallelism, it was necessary to iterate uh, several times in the uh, host uh, CPU code, um, launch kernels, these kernels execute <clears throat> on the <clears throat> GPU side, and whenever they finish uh, the uh, computing on the GPU side, control returns to the CPU, we have to move some information from the, or some intermediate results from the GPU memory to the CPU memory for the CPU to figure out what should be the dimensions of the next grid to be launched for execution on the GPU side. So this is why we see all this back and forth movement between the CPU and the GPU and all these data movement um, uh, expressed here through this uh, main copy or CUDA main copy uh, operations that move intermediate results from the GPU memory to the CPU memory for the CPU to figure out what needs to be done um, and in the next steps. However, if you have uh, a dynamic parallelism uh, uh, in, in, in Kepler and later architectures is possible to handle all these um, uh, uh, flow, these data flow dependencies uh, through the uh, launching multiple kernels from within the uh, GPU code itself. As you can see, now we have all these iterations on the GPU code, and in each iteration we have uh, successive launches of the necessary kernels. So how do we launch kernels from within a kernel? What's the syntax for a child kernel launch? A parent kernel launches a child kernel with exactly the same syntax as the host. And this is more or less how it looks. This is the kernel name, and this is the execution configuration. As you may remember, when we started talking about CUDA, uh, we mentioned that the very first parameter here is the uh, uh, is a, a special, a specifies the dimensions and size of the grid, that is the number of thread blocks in the grid, the number of thread blocks that are going to execute the kernel itself. Um, here, the next parameter is uh, called here DB, specifies the dimensions uh, and the size of each thread block. Uh, then we have this um, optional uh, um, uh, parameter NS that specifies the number of bytes in sh in, uh, of shared memory that are dynamically allocated uh, per thread block. And finally, also uh, um, an option parameter is the uh, is this S of type CUDA string T that specifies the stream associated with this call. Remember that we talk about CUDA streams in uh, lecture five performance considerations. Uh, we are going to recap very briefly on them because they are also important for the performance of uh, the, the kernels using CUDA dynamic parallelism. A very uh, the important consideration up from is uh, synchronization, how parent and child synchronize, how, par how, 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 how can the child uh, see the, uh, the, the, the work that has been produced by the parent. Um, in that case, is uh, relatively simple because memory consistency is guaranteed from parent to child. And what that means is that when the execution of the child kernel starts, all data that has been uh, written uh, from the parent uh, to the global memory is already available in global memory for the child to access it and use it. However, if uh, for, for uh, in the other direction from the child to the parent is necessary to use CUDA device synchronized to make sure that the uh, child terminated and all data written uh, by the child to the global memory is already there for uh, being used by the parent. And here you can see a very uh, typical timeline where a CPU thread launches one grid, launches one uh, kernel. In this case, is uh, grid A that is a parent. This grid A uh, runs multiple threads. Some of these threads launch uh, children, for example, this uh, grid B child. And, um, and, and here we'll have also a number of uh, GPU threads running. And as soon as they complete, the control returns to the uh, first, to the uh, parent. And when the parent kernel finishes, control returns to the uh, CPU thread. If we want to make sure that the, this uh, thread here can make use of the 
intermediate data produced by this child kernel will have to use this CUDA device synchronized here. But this is not different from what we have to do with the CPU thread whenever we want the CPU thread to make sure, to be sure that uh, whatever uh, that, that the uh, GPU kernel terminated. We use um, uh, CUDA device synchronized in a very similar way as we uh, saw in the beginning of this course. Okay, we are going to go uh, a little bit more into the details of how to use this uh, CUDA dynamic parallelism. And we start with a sim very simple example. It's more like a synthetic workload that is going to allow us to understand how to use dynamic parallelism. This is our original code without uh, using dynamic parallelism. It's a, a kernel, as you can see, it has uh, two um, 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 parameters here that identify a start and end of the data that needs to be processed. And here we have uh, this uh, input data that is uh, some data and more data. Observe that uh, here we are using a number of thread blocks and a number of threads. Um, for each thread, we have this uh, index i that is kind of a global identifier. And by using this uh, global index, we can access the arrays and perform some work. But then at some point, we'll have to do uh, even more work, iterating multiple times on, uh, over the uh, other array that is called here, uh, more data, and, uh, and then the uh, kernel will terminate. So here, if you look at the number of iterations that each individual thread is uh, performing here, uh, it's uh, essentially a constant number of iterations because of all threads that are running uh, and executing this kernel, a star and n have the same value because the start and n were provided as input parameters and are the same for uh, all threads that run this uh, code here. So the number of iterations is exactly the same and we have a balanced execution. In these type of cases, probably doesn't make sense to use dynamic parallelism, but it's going to make much more sense wherever we have load imbalance or a non-uniform workload, such as this case. Observe that here, a start and n vary depending on the uh, index i of the uh, specific thread uh, in the GPU. And what this means is that the number of iterations of this for loop is dependent on the input, is dependent on the uh, thread ID. And uh, what this uh, causes is that we are going to have load imbalance and there will be some threads that will finish the execution much earlier than others. And this essentially is not good for uh, parallel machines and not good for uh, GPUs. So in these cases, it might make sense to use dynamic parallelism because in dynamic parallelism, in order to execute that for loop, we can launch a complete new kernel that is going to assign one iteration per thread in this particular example. And based on that, we are going to have uh, load balancing across the threads that are running on the GPU. So this is more or less how the syntax work. Now we have to divide the whole, the complete execution into two kernels. First, we have the parent kernel. Observe that the input parameters to the parent kernel, the parent kernel are the same ones that they were in the, in the previous slide. Again, here we have an index that identifies uh, each uh, thread globally. And then each individual thread is going to launch a child kernel uh, with a number of threads that depends on the number of elements of the input arrays that it needs to process. So in this particular case, remember that we had uh, n and start that were input dependent, that were dependent on the uh, index of, the, of, the, uh, of each particular GPU thread. So what we are doing here is launching a number of thread blocks of 256 threads each. And, um, uh, and we pass uh, a start i and end i and the array more data as parameters. Uh, and then uh, each uh, thread is launching this uh, child kernel as uh, looks like, uh, uh, like this. So um, as you see, we are essentially in this child kernel distributing the iterations that we had in the original for loop uh, across all the available threads in the child kernel. So in this case, instead of having multiple different iterations for the different threads as we have, in the, as we, uh, have seen in the previous slide, we are going to have a different number of child threads in each of these child kernel calls uh, 
but this way, good thing is that the amount of computation per each of these child threads is going to be the same. So we have more load balancing. This is just a very simple example. Let's go to a more complex example that also is more realistic, let's say. In this case, we are going to talk about Bezier lines. Bezier lines are used in vector graphics to generate a smooth curves. And there are different types of uh, Bezier lines depending on the number of control points. These control points define the shape of the curve. Um, yeah, here in the slide, as an example, you can see a linear, uh, linear Bezier curves where we only have two control points that they are P0 and P1. And what we do is a linear interpolation between uh, P0 and P2. So what we essentially do here is uh, uh, drawing uh, a, a line from P0 to uh, P1. But in the quadratic Bezier, Bezier curves, we have uh, three control points, in this case, P0, P1, and P2. And what we do here is first a linear interpolation from P0 to P1, and then a linear interpolation from P1 to P2. If we uh, simplify this expression here, we will obtain uh, this expression here. And as you see, this is a quadratic expression. Uh, here you can see just uh, one ex some examples of uh, you know different curves depending on what's the relative position of uh, the control points P0, P1, and P2. So depending on this relative position, we are going to have more or less curvature. So uh, uh, when when it comes to uh, computing obtaining the Bezier lines, what we need to calculate is the curve itself based on the, uh, the positions of the control points. So we are given the control points based on the control points P0, P1, and P2. We have to calculate the curvature of, the, of this uh, curve. And then once we know the curvature, we will calculate each of the points, each of these tessellation points that compose the uh, line itself that compose the curve. And how we do how can we do this in CUDA? In the example that we are going to um, consider here, uh, we uh, consider a, a kernel that is going to generate multiple Bezier lines, not only one, multiple Bezier lines. And without dynamic parallelism, the way that we um, organize computation is by assigning one line per uh, thread block. So very first thing when the kernel starts, is to um, calculate, compute what's the curvature for these uh, particular, for the particular, uh, um, uh, for, 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 for the particular line or the particular curve that is going to be generated by one specific thread block. And once we know the curvature, we can calculate the number of tessellation points that we need to calculate later. Then, based on this number, uh, these uh, number of tessellation points, we will have to iterate more or less times for the threads belonging to the thread block to compute the tessellation points themselves. As you see, it's a relatively complex computation where we first uh, compute this um, U uh, based on the, on the index uh, of, the, of the thread, because here each uh, thread is computing one point in each iteration of this uh, for loop. So based on the index of the thread, we know the index of the point itself. We compute this U. And then uh, based on, uh, on this U, we can compute the uh, quadratic Bezier coefficient, coefficients. Once we know these coefficients uh, and using the control points, we can calculate the exact position of um, each of the uh, tessellation points. And finally, we will write this um, a position to the uh, global memory. If we want to uh, perform this computation with dynamic parallelism, there is uh, one key difference from the beginning. First of all, we are not going to assign one line per thread block. We are going to assign one line per GPU thread, one line per uh, thread. So as you see in the parent kernel, um, we assign one, uh, the, the one line to uh, each uh, thread index, to each thread. And, and, and the very first thing to do is, again, computing the curvature, as we did in the previous code. And after that, uh, we compute also the number of tessellation points. Now that we know the number of tessellation points, we can allocate as much um, uh, GPU memory space as we need for these 
uh, tessellation points. This is actually something different, different with respect to the uh, previous uh, code uh, in the previous slide, because if we don't, uh, uh, so if, if, I mean, we could use um, this uh, code analog as well in the previous code, but um, it's, uh, it's actually not here. Uh, here we are assuming that uh, there is a maximum number of tessellation points per line. Uh, so that's the amount that we are allocating um, for uh, each of the lines, while here we are uh, uh, allocating only as much as we need. There are both uh, uh, possibilities. I, I mean, this code analog would be applicable to uh, both codes indeed, but it's a difference that I wanted to highlight here. So after having allocated using this code analog, we launch the child kernel. Observe that uh, we launch a, a child kernel that is specifically tailored in its size to the number of tessellation points that the corresponding line uh, contains and we have to calculate. So once we know the number of tessellation points and here assuming that we are going to use uh, child thread blocks of size 32, this is going to be the number of thread blocks that the child kernel will have and then each thread launches its uh, child kernel. And this is how the child kernel looks. If you uh, look at the at the body of this uh, kernel here, is in the end it's essentially the same uh, body as the for loop that we had in the version without dynamic parallelism, where we first compute this uh, u parameter, then we compute the uh, quadratic Bezier coefficients, and based on that on them and based on the control point, we can calculate the um, uh, uh, position of uh, each of the tessellation points. But and and here. Uh, the, the computation for each tessellation point is performed by one thread in the uh, GPU child kernel. So let's uh, start talking about some performance considerations. In the end, when we have a parent kernel and we have many um, uh, GPU parent threads that start launching child kernels, these child kernels should go somewhere. These child kernels should go to the uh, kernel um, management unit that um, uh, uh, it's uh, going to uh, you know, handle how the uh, uh, different kernels and how the thread blocks in these uh, kernel grids uh, are scheduled. Um, so uh, we need to have some place where we store, let's say the information about the child kernels for some time until they are scheduled. And this is what we call the launch pool. Originally, before CUDA 6.0, the, si the size of this uh, launch pool was fixed. And it, was, it wasn't it was possible to launch more than this fixed size. But after uh, CUDA 6.0, a, a variable size pool was also um, included, uh, such that even if the uh, fixed uh, size pool was already um, let's say, um, uh, was uh, already occupied, uh, we could continue um, um, uh, enqueuing kernels for later execution in this uh, variable size uh, pool. That is a kind of a virtualized space that uh, allocates uh, some space in, in global memory. And, uh, and even though, and we are going to see that in the next slide, even though that uh, entails or may, may entail um, some performance overhead, but at least it was possible to launch as many child kernels as needed. Um, the good thing is that the size of this uh, fixed size pool that uh, by default is 2048 is configurable and we can definitely increase the size of this fixed size pool. And that's what we did as an experiment for the uh, Bezier lines code. And here you can see in, the, in this graph, the execution time for the Bezier line uh, code for this uh, number, um, 60K, 16K uh, different lines computed by your kernel. And here you can see how the execution time changes as we increase the uh, size of the uh, fixed size uh, launch pool. De by default, uh, it's 2048. As, as you see, as we start uh, increasing the size of this pool, we see how the execution time reduces and essentially reduces up to two orders of magnitude uh, when we have as many, uh, you know, as, as many slots uh, in the fixed size launch pool as the actual number of child kernels that we are 
going to launch it is uh, 16K because it's the number of Bessier lines that we wanted to compute in this example. So this is the very first performance consideration used uh, a launch pool, a fixed size launch pool that has a size that is appropriate for the problem that you are trying to solve. The second important consideration relates to CUDA streams. As I said in the beginning, CUDA streams are, is our feature that uh, we introduce in lecture five performance considerations. CUDA streams have, the, um, have many good things because they allow us to overlap uh, different operations, like for example, computation on the GPU and data transfers. They allow us essentially to hide the um, overhead that the data transfers um, entail. And streams are also important to use uh, in, um, in, in, GP, in, in the CUDA dynamic parallelism. There is a default stream per block, but it's also possible to create multiple streams per block. Uh, in the end, one stream is just a sequence of operation that happen in order. And if we have a single uh, stream, just the default stream per thread block, What's going to happen if um, all threads in uh, each of the thread, block, uh, thread blocks launch uh, a new uh, child kernels uh, with a single um, a stream per thread block, what's going to happen is that the execution of these um, kernels is serialized. So uh, the, uh, the total execution time is going to be longer than if we use as many uh, streams as child kernels we are going to use, or at least as, as many streams as uh, threads, parent threads, uh, we are executing because this way, and as long as there are enough available resources on the GPU, these kernels can all execute in parallel. And as you see, we can uh, save a large amount of execution time. Just for uh, comparison here, you can uh, see what's the code for the, say, the default uh, child kernel launch. Uh, where we are not really using um, any stream explicitly. We are just using the default stream per thread block, per parent thread block. And this is the modified code to use multiple streams. In this particular case, we are using a different stream uh, for each uh, child kernel launch. After the uh, child kernel terminates, we will uh, destroy the uh, stream as usual. And, 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 and as I said, this is, uh, may have uh, important performance impact, the use of uh, per thread streams instead of the uh, default per thread block stream. And here you can uh, again see an example for the Bezier lines, for different number of lines, how the execution time of the version with uh, per thread streams is, usually, is uh, in general um, uh, obtaining uh, like, uh, shorter execution time. And this is especially noticeable uh, when the number of lines is pretty small, because when the number of lines is, uh, is very small, we are not launching so many kernels. So if these kernels are serializing their execution, we are not using all the available GPU cores, all the available uh, resources on the GPU. So the uh, performance difference is much larger. As we increase the number of uh, lines in, in the problem and we increase the number of uh, child kernel launches, uh, you know, the, the, the difference between using the default stream and the per thread streams is much smaller because also inside um, each thread block, even though we're going to be using only in the, the, the default uh, stream, we are only using one stream uh, per thread block, um, we have multiple thread blocks that can launch um, uh, different kernels and make better use of, uh, of the uh, available GPU resources. But it's still, as you see, it's always preferable to use per thread streams rather than the default per block stream. Okay, let's uh, go a little bit deeper. And now we are going to cover a more complex example. This is a recursive example. We are going to talk about uh, quad trees that are a very nice way of arranging input for gather parallelization. Imagine that you have a input data distribution in a space that may not be uh, uniform. In these cases, it's good to be able to somehow cluster these uh, input data in some way that is more manageable for 
uh, further uh, computation, for further execution. And um, in these type of uh, uh, problems, data structures like quad trees or oak trees uh, can be uh, pretty useful. Um, but um, so we are going to see, we are going to focus on quad trees and we are going to see how we can um, use them to somehow predetermine what are the uh, input elements that are needed to calculate the output elements uh, in the uh, in a later problem. Problem. Uh, so um, this entails uh, like we, we have a need of doing a dynamic search and we have a need of uh, uh, somehow clustering the input data in a way that is, as I said, more manageable by the later steps of the computation. And also, this uh, is a good example as well to explain how to do recursion using uh, CUDA dynamic parallelism. In the case of the quad tree, we consider that we have a two-dimensional space that uh, contains multiple points that need to be, or atoms that need to be used for a, a later computation. But uh, what we are going to do, as I said, is to cluster these points in a way that they are more manageable. So in the case of the quad tree, what we do is partitioning recursively the two-dimensional space into quadrants, and we are going to keep doing so until we reach a certain threshold, a minimum threshold. Uh, there is a number, the minimum number of uh, points or atoms that we want to have in a, in a specific quadrant. So in depth zero, or in the first level of our quad tree, what we have is uh, the, the two-dimensional space with uh, all the uh, available points, as you see in the slide. In the next level, in depth one, we have we are uh, have partitioned the space in, in these uh, four quadrants, and we uh, uh, you know we, we we have we identify what are the uh, different points or atoms that belong to the different quadrants. In those cases where the number of points or these quadrants where the number of points is larger or higher, uh, greater than the uh, threshold, we continue the partitioning, we continue generating new quadrants. In this case, in, in depth two, uh, we have partitioned this uh, whole quadrant here and this whole quadrant here. In depth three, uh, we continue doing so uh, by just uh, only in this uh, last uh, quadrant that we have here. So let's see how we. Uh, perform this um, partitioning for a quad tree in a recursive manner uh, using CUDA dynamic parallelism. In the very beginning, the thread, uh, the, the, the host thread, the, the CPU thread is going to launch a GPU kernel with just one single thread block that is going to be the parent of all other thread blocks uh, running later on the GPU. And we assign the entire space, the entire two dimensional space to this thread block. This is essentially the um, uh, um, flow diagram of the uh, recursive kernel that this uh, block zero is going to execute. So first of all, we assign the block to one node. Is that remember that we are talking here about the tree and we are in the very first level. So this is uh, this block zero is going to somehow work with the uh, let's say root node of the quad tree. And the very first thing that the uh, thread block needs to do is first of all, check that the number of points in the two dimensional space is greater than the minimum number of points greater than the threshold. Remember from the previous slide that uh, in this example, we are considering a threshold equal to two. And also uh, that the depth or the level where we are is uh, uh, less than the maximum depth. And that's important because the uh, you know, maximum depth that we can uh, have in uh, you know, re recursive examples or recursive codes uh, using dynamic parallelism is not um, infinite. There is a maximum depth. If I recall correctly, this maximum depth was uh, 24. You can check the CUDA programming guide to, uh, uh, to see the uh, exact number. So if these conditions are not fulfilled, then we exit. But if they are fulfilled, uh, we first of all compute the center of the bounding box. This is the bounding box surrounding all points in our problem. In our problem. So the center is going to be more or less around here. And now, we are going to count what's the number of points in each of the quadrants. Based on this number of points in each of the quadrants, we are going to compute some 
offsets using a scan operation in order to uh, figure out what's going to be uh, the place in the output array or the output buffer where we have to um, exactly uh, place uh, the different points that belong to uh, different um, uh, different quadrants and based on that uh, we reorder the points and launch the uh, children the the child kernels. So uh, originally we assign these contents of buffer zero to block zero. Observe that. Uh, the contents of uh, these buffer zero are, are the, uh, uh, the, the points that belong to the two-dimensional space. Um, uh, so what we do is, uh, as I said, dividing in four quadrants the whole space and then uh, counting what's the number of points in each quadrant. For example, in this, um, uh, uh, in, in this first quadrant, we have two points. Uh, here we have seven points. Here we have Again, two points. Based on that, we can perform a scan operation to find the exact offset where the points of each quadrant need to be placed. So, if there are two points in, in the, say, uh, this uh, quadrant zero, this is quadrant one, and this is quadrant two. So, there are two points in quadrant zero, there are um, seven points in quadrant one. So, that means that. Uh, the elements, the points of quadrant two need to be written after this um, index nine of the uh, buffer one, of the output buffer. So this is the way that uh, we partition the space in the very first level uh, of the quad tree in depth zero. So uh, as you see as well, uh, the, uh, uh, this uh, block zero is going to launch uh, four uh, children. And now we are in, in depth one, in depth one, Block zero has launched four children. What we do is assigning each of the four quadrants to each of the uh, four thread blocks, and they essentially perform recursively the same uh, computation as the parent did. So uh, to uh, block zero, for in, in this uh, uh, particular example, for this uh, block zero in, in, in depth one, it only has uh, two points here. Same as this uh, block two, is all, it also only has uh, two points here. So they don't have to continue doing anything because there is no need to further uh, subdivide or, or subpartition the uh, corresponding quadrant. But we do that for uh, this uh, area here, for this uh, quadrant one, and for this quadrant three. Um, and uh, so we, again, find what's the uh, center of the quadrant, we partition in uh, four new quadrants, and then we place the uh, corresponding points in the uh, right place in the output buffer. Observe that when going from one level to the other level, the output of the previous level becomes, or the buffer, the output buffer of the previous level becomes the buffer, the input buffer of the current level. In this case, input buffer is uh, B, uh, buffer one, output buffer is uh, buffer zero. And then uh, we continue uh, to the, let's say, next level. So each uh, of the four, I mean, actually each of the thread blocks that remain active until the end launch uh, four new children and assign to these new children the corresponding quadrants uh, that they uh, generate. And at the uh, very end is only this uh, last block here that launches four new children, but these four new children will see that none of them have uh, more points than the threshold, so they just need to terminate and um, indeed uh, copy uh, the uh, uh, data to the output buffer. In this particular example, we are considering that the output uh, is going at the end of the execution of the of the whole uh, program. The output is going to be in uh, buffer zero. So uh, before every thread block retires, they have to make sure, and especially if there is no uh, further partitioning, they have to make sure that the output is in uh, buffer zero. That's why we see that um, you know that the, the whole output, the complete output, uh, is here in buffer zero. And here you again essentially have a summary of what has happened in buffer buffer zero as, and buffer one as we made progress uh, the level after level, depth zero, one, two, and three. So in summary, the execution starts with the host launching one thread block, and at each recursion, 
uh, if the number of points or atoms in a quadrant is less than or equal to the threshold, the thread block exits. Uh, at each recursion, uh, threads in each thread block that do not exit will collaboratively determine what's the number of points in each quadrant, then perform a scan operation to identify, to find what's, what are the offsets or the starting points of, uh, let's say, the starting index of each quadrant, then reorder the atoms or points such that all atoms in the same quadrant are placed consecutively in the output array. And finally, one representative thread in each thread block will launch a new kernel with uh, four child, uh, child blocks. So that's uh, the how to construct a quad tree using dynamic parallelism and GPU. We could also apply similar method, method to uh, for constructing uh, oct trees that are useful for uh, three-dimensional spaces. Uh, in this case, uh, each 3D space is divided into eight, eight octants and each uh, parent thread block, instead of launching four child thread blocks or a grid with or a kernel with four a thread block where is a kernel with eight thread blocks. And this is, as I said, another potential uh, use case of uh, CUDA dynamic parallelism. But let me give you a few more. For example, um, using CUDA dynamic parallelism for library calls, uh, whenever we uh, have a, you know, a GPU uh, kernel that uh, at some point needs to make use of a third-party library, um, it's, uh, it's something that uh, CUDA dynamic parallelism allows. As you see here, this CUBLAS DGEM is launched by this um, uh, thread ID uh, equals zero uh, due to the fact that it's using uh, CUDA dynamic parallelism internally. And we also see another uh, use case, for example, to avoid the launch overhead. This is a, 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 a specific uh, use case is uh, this uh, lattice quantum chromodynamics, where we have a large number of calls uh, to Kublas. And um, uh, the, you know, in, in this particular uh, setup, the uh, CPUs were not very powerful. They were um, ARM CPUs, so they were not fast enough to quickly launch uh, many kernels. So the GPU was underutilized. So here, the idea was to save uh, the kernel launches in the ARM CPUs by using dynamic parallelism. And instead of returning control to the CPU, uh, we had kind of a wrapper kernel with a single um, uh, thread of control uh, inside the GPU that launches uh, the uh, kernels, uh, new kernels on the, uh, on the GPU. And as you see here, you can uh, see just a summary of results for uh, you know, different um, cases, different number of uh, kernel calls and, and the speed up that uh, was achieved for this particular use case. But even though you have seen just seen some performance improvements, some thanks to the use of dynamic parallelism, that's not uh, always the case. There are definitely some performance limitations. Dynamic parallelism en ensures better work balance and offers advantages in terms of programmability. However, launching grids with a very small number of threads could lead to severe underutilization of GPU resources. So as a general recommendation, it's um, uh, launch uh, child reads with large number of thread blocks, or at least with thread blocks with many, many threads, with hundreds of threads, if the number of blocks is uh, as small. That's important for performance. If that doesn't happen, then we are going to have a lot of uh, child grids to be launched with a very little amount of threads where we are going to have to pay the overhead of launching a child grid without amortizing it because the number of threads uh, per a child grid is going to be uh, very small. Uh, also, in terms of uh, nested parallelism or tree processing, as as we uh, the example we have seen uh, for for quad tree, um, uh, uh, thick tree nodes are uh, more desirable, uh, where each node deploys uh, many threads, or uh, and or the branch degree is large, so each parent node has many children, so each parent thread block is going to launch many uh, child thread blocks, and also. Um, uh, we should 
make sure that these trees are relatively shallow because as I said, there is a nesting depth that is uh, limited in hardware. And um, so that uh, prevents us from, you know, like uh, creating like uh, very deep trees. So these are some performance limitations of dynamic parallelism, but we should also, we can also figure out ways of optimizing the use of dynamic parallelism. And in some way, uh, for example, alleviating the uh, launch overhead, which is a uh, you know, like key uh, performance bottleneck for dynamic parallelism. These are some of the advantages that dynamic parallelism has in CUDA or OpenCL 2.0, dynamic load balancing, datum dependent execution, recursion, programmability and maintainability. But as we just said, many fine-grained child kernels incur high kernel launch overhead and underutilization of the uh, GPU resources. And this launch overhead is on the critical path and it's a problem together with the limited depth of the uh, call stack. So um, we have a motivation that is uh, alleviating uh, this uh, large launch overhead uh, that is caused by fine-grained kernels that underutilize the uh, GPU resources. And, uh, and we can actually see that there is a non-trivial overhead from this uh, device side kernel launching due to parameter allocation, launch command, dispatch kernel, and also, you know, that the, this queue of pending kernels, whenever parents start launching kernels, these uh, child kernels have to go uh, somewhere to the kernel management unit and stay there for some time. The, the parents get su suspended. At some point, they, they will have to uh, be uh, awakened. Uh, but in the end, all of these entails a, a large overhead of using dynamic parallelism. And from a previous study uh, presented in 2014, uh, you can see the large difference in performance uh, of the, you know, like uh, the actual uh, use of uh, CUDA dynamic parallelism and the ideal use of CUDA dynamic parallelism with all these uh, launch overheads. And um, as you see, so this is a speed up compared to over uh, compared to known uh, CVP versions. Interestingly, the ideal dynamic parallelism could achieve significant speed up in many many cases, like uh, speed ups close to you know three times. For you know, here we have a like, different. Uh, workloads and also with different data sets, um, while the uh, you know actual performance of CUDA dynamic parallelism is uh, pretty bad, and, and actually there's essentially no speed up in any of these cases. So based on these um, you know the, the, the motivation, uh, we came up with uh, one idea that is called uh, kernel launch aggregation. It's an idea that we presented in. Uh, micro 2016, and I would like to um, introduce now. So uh, remember that uh, in CUDA dynamic parallelism, we have uh, different uh, threads in the parent kernel, in the parent grid that are eventually going to launch uh, child kernels. And if these child kernels are very fine grained, we will see a large uh, overhead from uh, all these child kernel launches. So the key idea in uh, this uh, kernel launch aggregation is to aggregate together at different granularities the, uh, the child kernel launches for, from multiple uh, parent threads. We can operate at warp granularity, meaning that instead of having all threads in the warp, launching each of them their own uh, child kernels, what we do is aggregating all these child kernels from the parents belonging to the same warp and having just one thread per warp launching one whole aggregated kernel that in the end, because it's uh, just one uh, thread launching per warp, we are going to um, alleviate the overhead of launching the child kernels. So this is at the uh, warp granularity. We could also do it at thread block granularity where we aggregate together all the child kernel launches from all the threads belonging to the same thread block and just one thread per thread block performs, execute or, or, or launches um, like aggregated child kernel for all the parent threads uh, in this program. And the last possibility that we explore is the 
uh, you know, aggregating at the kernel granularity. So uh, what we do here is that the, we keep track of the uh, uh, child kernels that each of the parent threads would like to launch. We terminate the kernel, return the control to the host, and then tell the host launch uh, a whole new kernel with uh, as many thread blocks as were needed by the original parent. So this is what we call the uh, kernel granularity. And here you can see the three possibilities, either one thread per warp launching child kernels, one thread per thread block launching child kernels, or either terminating uh, the uh, parent and launching the child uh, kernel from the host. Because all these transformations were done um, uh, you know, automatically but by a compiler uh, that we designed, this really didn't entail any extra overhead for programmers. So programmers could naively write their code using the plain dynamic parallelism. And after that, use the CLAP compiler in order to perform the aggregation and um, obtain much more performance as you are going to see. But we, before we go into the, any uh, results, let me very quickly uh, describe how the aggregation work. And as an example, we are going to use the aggregation at block granularity. So here in the slide, you can see the original kernel uh, where we have, um, you know, this is the original uh, child kernel call. Uh, where each of these uh, threads in the parent grid are launching, you know, as uh, you know, child kernels uh, with uh, as many thread blocks as they need. So um, each of them need to use a number of uh, of uh, thread blocks in the child kernel. For example, here for this thread zero is uh, only one. For this uh, thread one is two thread blocks, and here is. Uh, one thread block while this thread here doesn't launch any child we define as well or each of these threads defines as well what's the number of threads per thread block for the corresponding child kernels and then each of them have their uh, own input arguments so in the transform kernel call at the block granularity what we do is we first allocate some arrays for the arguments for the grid dimensions and for the block dimensions. So uh, the threads, before doing anything else, what they are going to do is uh, placing the uh, corresponding arguments in the corresponding arrays and also storing the uh, grid dimension and block dimensions that they need for their uh, child kernels. So um, what we are going to do is uh, calculating or reducing uh, this array that contains the number, the, the, the grid dimensions for the individual child kernel calls. So we obtain the sum of all of these. Remember, this is uh, here is one, here is two, here is one. So total is going to be four. And for the number of threads, what we do is using the maximum of uh, the number of threads that uh, each of the uh, 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 GPU parent threads wants to have in the corresponding child kernel. So, and, 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 and next, what we do is we, because we are aggregating all the uh, child kernel calls together, we are going to have a single uh, launcher thread per block or per warp in the case of the uh, warp granularity. And this launches the aggregated child kernel that has a new grid dimension, a new block dimension. These new grid dimension and new block dimensions are given by the sum of the grid dimensions and the maximum of the block dimensions, as we have seen, and um, as inputs uh, have these uh, arrays of uh, uh, arguments and also the arrays of grid dimensions and block dimensions, because they are going to be important for each of the um, individual thread blocks in the child, in the aggregated child kernel to figure out what are their original parents. So uh, in the aggregated kernel, essentially, uh, it's going to look very similar to the original child kernel. But now in the aggregated child kernel, first of all, is to calculate the index of the parent thread. So each of these threads here and each of these thread blocks here need to know what was the uh, 
parent in the uh, parent kernel. And then based on that, they are going to load the parameters from the uh, arrays of parameters. They are going to retrieve the parameters that were stored in these arrays by their corresponding parents. And same, same thing, they are going to uh, figure out what was the uh, actual uh, grid dimension and block dimension from the arrays of uh, grid dimensions and block dimensions. And they also calculate the actual block ID or what was the block ID in the original uh, problem in the original case, but what's the block ID that they are going to use as kind of a virtual block ID that is going to be uh, you know, important for them to know what's the computation that they have to perform. So if the uh, thread index is uh, less than the actual uh, block dimension, then this uh, thread in the uh, child kernel, in the, in the aggregated child kernel is going to perform the uh, actual uh, computation. It's going to execute this kernel body. And here in this slide, you see more or less an, an explanation of how the, each thread in the aggregated child kernel is going to figure out the index of the uh, parent thread. Remember that we had an array of uh, grid dimensions. It are, these are the grid dimensions, the number of threads per block that each of the parent threads wanted to have in the corresponding uh, child kernel. So um, uh, the, the uh, parent thread, uh, performs a scan operation of these array of grid dimensions. So the output looks like uh, this. And then uh, this is the block index in the aggregated child kernel. Remember that we have a thread block zero, thread block one, two, and three. By using this thread block index and um, by using, you know, by, by uh, finding, using an NR research uh, where exactly you know, the index um, uh, can be found in this uh, uh, scan array, we are able to figure out what's the original parent. So um, in this uh, particular case, we see that the, uh, you know, uh, first uh, thread block, so the, the um, so what we, what we see here, so in this line here, what we are obtaining is what's the uh, parent for uh, what's the parent for each of the block IDs in the child kernel, and then uh, what they do by subtracting, uh, you know, the corresponding element from the array of uh, scan grid dimensions, we subtract that in order to obtain the virtual block ID that is the, that would have been the block ID in the original child kernel before the aggregation. So uh, it turns out that this uh, thread block zero needs to be thread block zero in the, in the child kernel. This uh, thread block one is uh, thread block zero in the original program. So it's going to use this virtual block ID here, or this thread block two is uh, block one in the original child kernel. And this thread block Z three is uh, block zero in the original child kernel that was launched by the uh, corresponding parent. So this is the way that internally, and as you see, this aggregation logic that we need to add um, to the uh, child kernels in the end is going to entail a certain overhead, but it really pays off because we are alleviating the uh, whole cost of launching so many uh, child kernels. So if you uh, want to see some performance numbers, this is the speed up over the uh, say default, the original uh, uh, version with dynamic parallelism or naive version with dynamic parallelism for uh, different um, benchmarks like uh, you know, BFS, BH, uh, BT. So uh, you can uh, find uh, all the details about these uh, uh, different benchmarks in, in the actual paper. And also here you have the Geoming, these are results, the speed up results uh, of the uh, graph granularity, block granularity, and kernel granularity aggregation uh, compared to the, uh, uh, let's say, basic, uh, naive uh, CUDA dynamic parallelism. And you see like very uh, good uh, performance improvement in most of the cases. And these are, these were results, and uh, Maxwell, uh, sorry, uh, Kepler GBU, these are results on uh, 
Maxwell uh, GPU. And we can see, for example, in Kepler, a speed up of almost well, more than 6.5 times for the uh, kernel aggregation, thanks to the use of the uh, disaggregation technique that we are proposing in this paper. And actually, in order to screen the results and see where the performance improvement is coming from, what we uh, can see is that the performance improvement comes from the reduced launch overhead and also better reduced uh, resource utilization. So you see, for example, here in BFS that most of the execution time of the normalized execution time was spent on the launch overhead. We managed to reduce that a lot. And, um, and and essentially, like um, you know, the performance improvement is coming for uh, that reason, right? And and that's essentially what we see in, in most of the benchmarks that we use. In some uh, cases, as you see, even though the launch uh, overhead reduces a lot, but then we have some extra overhead for the aggregation logic, as I as I mentioned before. But it's still. Uh, it uh, really makes sense to do the aggregation because we are saving a lot of uh, execution time, as you can see in this slide. So we continue working on uh, improving on techniques for uh, uh, accelerating CUDA dynamic parallelism, for optimizing CUDA dynamic parallelism. And this year, just a couple of months ago, uh, we presented this compiler framework for optimizing dynamic parallelism on GPUs where uh, we combine all these techniques together, but also uh, even more uh, techniques. Like, for example, thresholding, there is an optimization that um, essentially, uh, you know, launches the child kernel only if the number of child threads is over a certain threshold, uh, because, you know, this way we make sure that we are not launching like very fine grained kernels. Uh, this uh, optimization was applied before, but it was applied manually by programmers. We integrated uh, the optimization in the compiler to make you know, um, easier use of dynamic parallelism. Another optimization that we integrated, and we were the first of using it for dynamic parallelism, is the coarsening of child thread blocks, where the block of multiple thread blocks is assigned to a single block. And this also uh, produces a little bit of uh, extra performance improvement. And we even uh, proposed a new um, you know, way of doing aggregation instead of the versions uh, warp at warp granularity, block granularity, or kernel granularity that uh, I just uh, explained. We propose here a multi block granularity that is something in between uh, of the block granularity and the kernel granularity. And it's also uh, pretty, it produces uh, quite good results in, uh, for uh, some of the benchmark and in some of the cases. And all these optimizations are put together in a compiler uh, framework that combines the three optimizations and makes uh, much easier to use uh, dynamic parallelism and much more efficient. So if you want to uh, take a look at the paper, um, it's um, available, uh, as, as you can see here, um, you, you have a link uh, here in this slide, and also the source code uh, is uh, indeed uh, available uh, for everyone's use. So in summary, CUDA dynamic parallelism extends the CUDA programming model to allow kernels to launch kernels. It um, uh, allows also to do dynamic memory allocation, dynamically uh, discover work, recursive algorithms, and better work balance and more efficient memory usage. We have seen that there are some uh, performance limitations, but we also uh, have explained how uh, we can use certain techniques to deal with this uh, overhead, this uh, launch overhead, for example, using the uh, kernel launch aggregation. Um, if you want to uh, read more about CUDA dynamic parallelism, you can, of course, go to the CUDA programming guide, but also chapter 13 of the book, Programming Massively Parallel Processors. This is all for today. I hope that you found the lecture useful. And if you uh, want to discuss um, anything with me or ask any questions, please uh, feel free to reach out. Thank you very much for your attention.